Um, we're going to be talking about the heart a lot. Obviously, you heard it from Psalms 111. Uh, there uh, in that first part of that verse, it says, Praise the Lord, I will give thanks to the Lord with part of my heart. Right? No, of course not. I'll give thanks to the Lord with all of my heart. Right? And that's what the Lord desires from all of us, is that we would come and worship him and thank him with all of our heart, being totally connected, totally committed, totally vulnerable in his hands to uh, have a relationship with him as we would have a relationship with some of the most significant people in our lives. Hopefully, we're fighting for um, clarity and we're fighting for... Um, um, intimacy in our relationships, and, and that should be true of the God that we serve as well. In this time of communion, then, we continue on with that idea of uh, having a heart that is right before the Lord. If you want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 with me, we get the section of Scripture that we always read in regards to the Lord's Supper. Um, obviously, when we were talking about Frog Club as well, he was talking about the heart and doing things full on for the Lord, not half-heartedly, not just, you know, making it look good with a lot of molding on your life, but really, really being sold out as well. Here again in 1 Corinthians 11, we have that same kind of heart attitude that needs to be right before the Lord. We really need to make sure that our heart is right before the Lord. And as we get into the sermon hour, we're going to be talking about the heart again once more. Um, just as a, a quick word of how we do things in our church, there are some churches who practice closed communion. Uh, we are a church that practices open communion. If you love the Lord uh, with your, all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and it is your desire to walk with Him and you're trusting in Him by faith uh, in the promised life to come, through the blood of Jesus Christ, then we want to encourage you to take part in the communion time with us. Uh, it would be our joy to have this celebration time uh, with you. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 then, beginning in verse 23, it says this way, For I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. Verse 24, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, because his heart isn't right, because he's not in step with the Lord, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Okay, so we need to participate in communion. We need to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, and that helps us stay centered on him, stay centered on the fact that we are desperately wicked, and we need a Savior. And every time we take this communion, we're saying, thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for my sins and covering my sins. So we need to take communion to proclaim it even to our own hearts, how desperately lost we would be without our Savior, Jesus Christ. But when we come, we are to examine our heart. Just make sure that you and him are good, that you and him are right, that there's nothing impeding that relationship. And in so doing, please, the command is take the cup. Um, but it does say here with a warning, if you don't do it correctly, verse 30, for this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. And hopefully there's a big amen in your Bible right after that point. We do not want to be condemned along with the world. Okay, if we're getting condemned along with the world, we're on our way to hell. We're on our way forever apart from the God of the universe, okay? If we experience his discipline now, praise God, you are a daughter, you are a son of the, of the king, and praise God for the discipline in your life to keep you humble and to keep you close to him. Praise God for that. 
So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. So I'm going to ask uh, Elder Frank Porter to come this morning, and we're going to pass out the plates. And as we pass the plate, um, wait for us. We'll open up the uh, cup and the bread together, and we'll say a word of prayer as we do it. But in this moment that we have, just examine your heart before the Lord. Well, brother, we need to say a word of thanks for the bread that was broken for us. Sure. Want to give that prayer for us? Sure. Dear Heavenly Father, we come humbly before you again this morning uh, with this time of remembrance of the sacrifice that you made for us on that day on the cross. Uh, we think of your body that was shed and broken and And that's just the beginning, that you took all our sins on you and wiped our slates clean. We can't thank you enough for that. So uh, right now we just praise you for the sacrifice of your body. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take this uh, bread together, okay? <clears throat> Then very carefully, if you want to pull back the lid of your grape juice here, I'll say another word of thanks. Father in heaven, we again thank you for your son. Lord, uh, this is a big deal, what's in our hands. This was a representative of what happened on the cross. This, On that day, uh, Christ's blood left his body. It was completely drained of... Uh, the life-giving nutrients that his body needed to survive. And Lord, we know that that blood was precious, and we know that that blood sanctifies us and washes us clean of our sins. And Lord, we cannot uh, thank you enough for his sacrifice. And Lord, we just pray that you'd find us walking in a right relationship with you. Lord, convict us of sin and help us to grow closer to you each and every day. Pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's take this cup together. Thank you, Frank. Just before the sermon, I'll give you a, a pastoral prayer here. Uh, for the sake of time, uh, I'm just going to go through some of these names that are on the on the list. And uh, with that being said, I. I don't want to lessen our prayer time. <laughs> um, after all, our Lord and Savior said that uh, his, his house, his temple, would be a place of prayer. Um, if you find yourself still praying long after I pray, praise God for that. Um, but we're just going to take a couple moments to pray together as a family. 
Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives. Lord, we thank you that we can have a relationship with you that is so precious. Lord, we thank you that, again, that you've saved us from our sins. Lord, we, we know how high and holy you are, how powerful you are. Lord, we're just so insignificant, and yet you found great worth in us. You've, you love us. You want us to be with you, and you've given everything for that relationship to exist. And Lord, again, we just cannot thank you enough for that. Lord, even this week as we um, took one of our own to a cemetery and laid her body to rest, Lord, we are again just grateful, knowing that even in that very somber moment uh, where we took Wanda's body to the grave, Lord, we know that that's not it. We know that she is... <laughs> brand new. We know that she is more alive now than she's ever been in her life. We know that even this moment she is singing praises to you and seeing the fulfillment of all of her faith in you come to life. And Lord, we just all can't wait for that day when we put so much faith in you, Lord, that you will do what you promised to us that you would do. And Lord, we just look forward to that day when all those promises do truly come to fruition. And Lord, we just thank you for the Wade family, and for what they've meant to our lives over these years. Lord, we just pray a special blessing on their whole family, but a special comfort and presence to be with them for sure, and, and even in this hour to um, Dwayne Wade, one of our uh, dear friends and longtime um, elders of the church. Lord, for all the other prayer requests that are on this list, Lord, you know them better than I do, and you know each situation better than I do, but Lord, we just want to read their names. Kimber and Adam McLaughlin, Peggy Powell and her family, Elva and his brother, Sidney Mills, Jeremy Porter, Joanna Barrett, Israel, and so many more. Lord, we just pray that you be uh, in each one of those situations. Lord, we look long to see you work miracles in each one. We just want to sing your praises and glorify you for how uh, you work out your will in each life. Pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. So the time that we have left, I'm going to have you turn uh, in your sex and scriptures to Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to try to get this uh, slideshow up here one more time. And maybe it'll help you with your visualization of what we want to talk about today. Okay, uh, for a while now, as you know, if you've been with us or if you've followed us on uh, the YouTube channel, uh, we have been in Matthew chapter 5. This is, again, as we've said from the beginning, probably the most important section of Scripture that you could possibly read, uh, hope to understand because you're reading the words of your Savior, you're reading the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're reading His most important, most impactful, most powerful sermon that's ever been preached on the face of the earth. I mean, to be in this text right now and to have his words recorded for us 2,000 years later is amazing. You know, what an amazing thing to have, to be able to hear the heart and the mind of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we know that this is called the Sermon on the Mount. We also know that uh, this is also lovingly called the Beatitudes because there are attitudes that we need to have in the Christian life, the attitudes that should um, come out of our life, uh, attitudes that we should embrace because we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. We have the word of God to look at. And so we need to have a correct heart attitude, if you will, towards the God of the universe. And so for that, or to that point, we read here in Matthew chapter five, uh, in these first I'm going to read 22 verses, I think, this morning. Uh, in these first 22 verses, you're going to hear the heart and the mind of, of the Lord, and you're going to hear how blessed you are if your heart and your mind is connected to him, and he is going to pour out his desire for your life in these first sections of Scripture. So let me just read them to you. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, says, When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened up his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And that is the verse that we're going to continue on uh, again this week. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say kinds, all kinds of evil against you because of me. That's important, not because of sin in your life, but because of him. Verse 12, rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And then let's read uh, a few verses here to get the context of what I'd like to share to you this morning. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but, under, uh, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Do not think I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard uh, that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough even to go into the fiery hell. Let's pray one more time. Father, what we do not know, we ask that you teach us. And Lord, what we do not have, we ask that you give us. Most importantly, Lord, we pray that you transform us into the likeness of your Son. We pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen. So just as a quick reminder of some of these verses that we were talking about, uh, here when we were kind of gave you a, an acronym or kind of uh, putting these things off to the side, and hopefully, you know, as the months progress or whatever, it'll just kind of help you remember what the pastor was talking about and how he put this together. Uh, I hope that it blesses your life in the future. But in verse 3, for example, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. We talked about how that relates to your mind, the intellectual side of who you are. Verse 4, blessed are they that mourn. This is the emotions, the proper emotional side of who we are. Verse 5, blessed are the meek. These are our actions. This is the proper way a child of God should act underneath the influence of the Holy Spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. This is, this is talking about the love that we have, the motives of our heart, um, uh, the things that we look for and long for. Verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive merciful and here we kind of pause and we just talked about individual stories, right? We just talked about how merciful our Father in heaven is. And likewise, we want to bring this down even to our own life. What's our individual story? Are we merciful? Are we forgiving or aren't we? Because scripture is clear. If you cannot forgive your brother, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Okay? You need to reciprocate the forgiveness that was given to you. If God is going to forgive all of your sin, and yet you cannot forgive one of your family members or one of your brothers or sisters, that's a big problem. That's a big problem. Okay? Verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And last, two weeks ago, we started talking about this idea of doing a good examination, doing a good examination on our heart. And we looked at 2 Corinthians 13, 5 for just a brief context of that. Again, I just wanted to kind of give you a sermon as simply as I possibly could. I'm just trying to make it easy on you by, by uh, saying that there's three different growths in a Christian life. And, I'm, and again, I'm just 
making this as sermon as easy to understand as possible. There's probably 10 different growths in a Christian life, but I'm just going to boil them down to a few. And last time we were together, we talked about some of those elementary truths that we need to understand. For example, if you're just in elementary school, if you're just coming into the faith, if you're just finding the Lord for the first time, if you're just establishing a relationship with Him, then one of the most elementary things that we need to understand is that we need to acknowledge the fact that we have an impure heart. Okay? Acknowledge it. Don't shrug it off like, well, I'm not as bad as that guy. No. If you've told one lie, you have fallen short of the glory of God. Okay? You need to acknowledge that there's impurity in your heart. We also need to acknowledge that we were at one point part of this world. And we looked at 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 about that. We also need to acknowledge that we were lost and we were carried away by the lust that was in our own heart. Okay? James chapter 1, 14 and 15 talked about that. You need to acknowledge that we're all sinners. Amen? I mean, we're all sinners. We're all trying. We're all reaching, okay? But if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus Christ, we would never make it. I mean, the only reason why we're ever going to get into the kingdom of heaven is because he died on the cross and forgave us of all of our sins. No amount of effort, no amount of good works will get you into the kingdom of heaven. But the reality is we need to acknowledge that we're sinners and we need to keep coming to the cross and, and keep proclaiming the cross even to ourselves that we need Jesus Christ in our life. We also need to understand that we have a heart that is desperately wicked, okay? It's, it's wicked above all things, as, as a scripture would say. And again, as I kind of was challenging you, like when scripture says all, the heart is des- desperately wicked above all things, does that include Satan himself? <laughs> How do you interpret all? I mean, I interpret all as all. Like there is more deceit. There is more... Uh, evil uh, in your own heart (laughs) than perhaps uh, is even in Satan himself. Like you need to understand that there is something broken inside of our human nature. We are desperately wicked and our heart is desperately wicked. And so again, we need mercy and we need grace. And that's where we left off last week. We need uh, his mercy uh, and his kindness to us. We need To him, give us something we don't deserve. And that is the grace. That is what we love about Jesus Christ. We know what we deserve. He's given us something we don't deserve. And praise God for that. And that should fire you up for him each and every day. And so the closing comments the last time we were together is that we just need to see the condition of our hearts. We need to do the examination. We really need to be faithful, to look at our heart. Or as the psalmist said in Psalms 139, let me just read that verse to you to kind of remind you. Psalms 139 and verses 23 and 24. Hopefully this is our prayer. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see, and see, please, if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me into the everlasting way. We want the everlasting way, right? So we take time to have the Lord examine our heart. We beg him, search me, know me, see if there's something in me, take care of it. I want a pure heart before you, okay? And that's what we're really talking about here in Matthew chapter five and verse eight, where it says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God, okay? For they shall see God. So again, uh, we push on. Again, humor me for the the sake of an outline. We are leaving some of the elementary truths that we learned last time and uh, uh, maybe some of the first truths that we've learned when we've come to know the Lord. And today we're going to enter kind of the high school years of our faith. Okay, this is the second level uh, of growth. Okay, so just bear with me here. We've read Matthew chapter 5 verses 1 through 22, uh, which will give us some of that context. And again, just recap this one more time. In elementary school, we learned about our heart condition and that we need mercy and grace. The law, like the Ten Commandments, brings conviction. It also brings condemnation. And that is all helpful to bringing us to the Lord, 
okay? In the high school years of our faith then, we look at the law and we say, the law is good, exclamation point. Like, praise God for the law. So we know who he is and so we know who we are and so we can be like him, okay? Uh, Sanctification is a blessing. You know, when you start growing and start becoming more and more like Jesus Christ, hopefully your your life becomes less complicated because you're not chasing a lie for years. You've gotten that right. Things are corrected. Hopefully your relationships are healing because you're loving and you're finding peace and transparency in those relationships. So maybe in some ways your life is less complicated because... You're more connected to the Lord and because you're becoming more and more like Christ and your sanctification is working through you. But it doesn't necessarily mean that your life is less complicated or less emotional, okay? Like, I think we all realize that in the structure of our life, there is a lot of emotionally complicated things that continue to feed our anxiousness and drive us to our knees and, and, and again, allow us to have more and more faith in Jesus Christ, and we should thank him for that. But if we were to just define pure, okay, if we're going to go from Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, well, I think we just need to stop for a moment and just ask ourselves, what does it mean to be pure? Okay, does anybody want to throw out a quick answer? When you think of something as pure, what do you think of? Sinless, sure. Something that's been refined, refined, maybe? Like a filtration system. You got pure water in this bottle, right? Sure. Okay. Like innocence. I think that's where you're kind of coming from, right? Like, thank God for an innocent child that is not uh, living in sin. Um, But yeah, those are all where I'm trying to head trying to get you towards is when you think about pure, when we look at this word in the original language, it, it is kind of the idea of free from contamination, okay? Or without mixture, okay? So there are, there's a lot of good things that mix well together, you know, like steak and salt, <laughs> all right? But <laughs> to be pure, it's either got to be salt or steak. We don't need steak-flavored salt. Oh, that'd be kind of cool, actually, but no, like... Pure, separate, set apart, okay? Other ways in Scripture, as you're reading through Scripture, we talk about holiness, we talk about uh, perfection, we talk about blamelessness, those type of things. And what we need to consider is what does it mean to have a pure heart before God? And I think once we're in kind of these high school years of our our faith, we're thinking a lot about our outward purity, Okay, a lot of things that we have changed about our life may be some of the most surfacey, outside of the body type of thing. So, for example, um, when we talk about being outwardly pure, um, maybe if I don't know, uh, you've lived this is this is a. If you were to give your daughter a purity ring, right, you're asking her to stay pure till marriage, right? It's kind of an outward reminder. Um, it, is, it does affect the heart, but from the outside, we hope that, you know, our kids will remain pure um, till the day of their marriage. Uh, even in the day and age that we live in, there was a purity movement there for a while. Um, in fact, the, the, the world knows what it means to be uncontaminated in that way, in the sense that they understand, like, this is a terrible example, but what is a uh, chastity belt? You ever remember seeing one of these? <laughs> Whoever created these things, like, they were they were trying, okay, to live a pure life. They would they would strap on metal underwear, all right, in, in an effort to stay pure, uh, you know, in their, in their life, okay? Um, these are some of the outward things that, uh, 
that people try to do. This was, I think, made Marion's uh, famous uh, whatever. The other thing that we do is, you know, we establish some uh, groups and stuff like Promise Keepers, right? It's a, like an outside organization. We try to uh, keep promises to our, our family and that type of stuff that we're going to live a holy life. There are some faith organizations like the Anabaptists. If you, when you think about the Amish community, which we have around our community, uh, they were first Anabaptists. They were a lot like us, actually. And then they... They continued down a path of trying to live for the Lord in a very conservative uh, way in which you see things that look a little extreme to us, but it's not extreme to them. You know, they, they are trying, like uh, the Mennonite church as well, to just live very simply. They're just trying to cover their outside of their appearance. So, you know, men were not attracted to their women, and women, they're not, you know, so much attracted to their men. They're, they're trying to, you know, protect the outside appearance of who they are in an effort to, you know, live as purely as they possibly can, okay? Another way to think about this uh, is actually from Matthew chapter 5, where it talks about being a light on a hill. So in Matthew 5 verses 14 through 16, it says, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. This city on a hill is a really good metaphor. It's a really good analogy, whatever you want to say, in the sense that our life should be so visible to the world. You know, people should know exactly who you are. Your life isn't hidden. It's not like as Christians, we live in the shadows, you know, and we're like part of the ninja community or something, you know, like everything is secret. No, like our life should be on a hill, you know, like different, uh, obviously unique, you know, and not hidden. Like we're, we're trying to live as, as purely and as righteously as we possibly can. And hopefully, uh, as the scripture goes on to say, people will see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. We don't, we don't need the glory, okay? But hopefully our good works and our solid actions and our outward actions of our life um, make people wonder what's different about us or what's driving us to look and act differently in the day and age that we live in. What we also find about this phrase of... Uh, or, or about, I should say, what we find is true about the religious community just in general is that once you are kind of out of the shadows and like for this example, you live like a city on a hill, okay? Um, criticism will naturally follow, okay? Um, so, for example, criticism will always follow the religious community. It will, it will always be that way. Anytime, really, if, if you even think about your work life, anytime you're acting differently than your employees or your coworkers, you get some criticism for that, right? Like, how come you're not part of the group? How come you're not like us? How come you're not doing the things that, that we're doing? This is the same kind of thing that I'm trying to drive you towards, is that criticism will always follow the religious and for ages now, people have considered whether or not the religious are in fact pure in heart or they're hypocrites. Like you, you see this city on the hill and you wonder, yeah, but, but is that really them, right? Are they really pure in heart? Are they really Christ followers or is this just a sham? Is this just a, a farce, you know, of who they are? And so oftentimes, you know, we get challenged as to whether or not we're a hypocrite. So someone wrote this once, someone who conveniently forgets their faults to point out someone else's would be a hypocrite, right? The question becomes for even us as believers, uh, are we hypocrites, you know? We're so consumed with uh, everybody else in our life that we conveniently forget about our own walk. We're, we're quick to judge our brother or sister for sin in their life, not so quick to examine our own heart, Right? And the world kind of picks up on this. 
Our friends pick up on this. If someone really knows you, like your wife or your children, like my children, for example, they will tell you point blank, my father's a pastor and he's a hypocrite. He lives like a sinner six days a week. I mean, she would, I hope she wouldn't say that, but somebody, somebody, somebody would know, okay? Or a hypocrite. The good thing about being a hypocrite is that you get to keep your values, right? And it's so true. You know, like you come to know the Lord and you value whatever this is. You, oh, I love you, Lord, totally. You know, like I'm with you, whatever. But you're, you're bringing your worldly values along with you. There's, there's something that you're mixing into your life that really has no part of a believer's life, you're holding on to it, you're, you're trying to keep it, and so you're saying, oh, I'm pure in heart towards the Lord, but you're trying to keep your sinful values with you, whatever, whatever you're hiding from the Lord, you're, you're trying to keep it from him, and you're living like a hypocrite. I also saw this sign, a hypocrite is a person who is not himself on a Sunday, Right? I mean, I appreciate signs like this. You know, like, do, do, do I live like this on Sunday and only on Sunday? Where I think about God and praise him and sing songs? Or do I think about him and do devotions and worship him and sing songs with him on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, Friday or Saturday? Or am I just a one day a week kind of Christian? Well, the scripture that we have is full of this kind of debate. And as you know, Jesus challenged the Pharisees whether or not they were hypocrites or not. And Paul even spoke to the Jews about that. I want to give you Paul's uh, argument first. You want to go to Romans chapter 2 with me? Romans chapter 2. I want to read a section of scripture here. Romans chapter 2, beginning verse 17. He writes, But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, Having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth, you therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? Ye who preach that one shall not steal, do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. For indeed, circumcision is of value if you practice the law. But if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So if the uncircumcision man keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you who, through having the letter of the law and circumcision, are transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. Now there's a lot of things that I would want to take out of here to give you this morning. Um, I think the first one there, when you're looking at verses uh, 17 and following. He was talking about the confidence sometimes that we have uh, as religious people. Again, he is speaking to a religious people in this moment. Um, that they are confident that they are a guide to people who are blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, as it said in verse 20, a teacher of immature people, possessing the law, body, of knowledge, and the truth. And to some degree, we would say that as believers in Jesus Christ, we are kind of like that. Like, we want to guide people into the truth. We want them to not be blind anymore and actually see 
Scripture for what it actually says. We want to be a corrector to the foolish. We want to be a teacher to the immature, all right, when we want to be able to help people in a, in a very loving and a very kind way. But on the same token, if you are preaching, like if I'm preaching this morning to you and I am not practicing what I am preaching, you would call me a what? A hypocrite. And so here in verse 24, we read that the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Because you have people who look on the outside and act on the outside uh, like they're very religious and they have all the answers, but on the inside, where it matters the most, okay, where the heart is, you you aren't even living the truths that you're preaching or teaching, okay? And that is a very, very terrible place to be in our Christian walk where we are more focused on the outwardly, like verse 28 says, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, okay? The Jews would uh, uh, circumcise their boys at uh, day eight, and uh, because of that circumcision, all of a sudden they were part of the family. They were, they were a Jew. Paul is trying to like, make the argument here, you're not a Jew just because you got circumcised. You, you've got to be a Jew on the inside, okay? It was quit putting so much um, faith into what is the outward experience of your life. Really, as verse 29 says, you need to look inwardly. You need to know whether or not the Spirit is circumcising your heart, whether or not he is cutting and scraping and taking and removing sin from your life so you're less and less mixed or mixed up, but more and more pure, okay? That, that's, that's what really matters. And so, you know, we need to ask ourselves, as even Christ would ask ourselves, are we only cleaning up ourselves on the outside? You know, when you think about a, a tomb, they whitewash the tomb. It looks pretty on the outside. In the, in the center of that tomb is death, right? There's something stinky going on in there, you know? And the same way it could be for our lives. It, is our aim truly to please God or is it not? Or do we just, you know, uh, look good on the outside and fool everybody? Uh, the reality is, of course, we're not fooling God. He, he knows your life and he knows the actions of your life and he knows what's in your heart. Matthew uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6 uh, Christ also talks about this. Go back there to the Sermon on the Mount here. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. It says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet. doodly do. Here's my gift. As the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. It's, it's temporary. People will praise you, but God's not going to praise you in heaven. Verse 3, And but when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that, now I believe in public prayer, okay, but someone's, praying publicly so that, as scripture would say, they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have the reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Um, there is this desire in our heart because our heart is desperately wicked, okay, to be recognized by people, okay? Um, I was just thinking real here off the, off the cuff, which I don't have time for, but I'm going to say it to you anyway. You know, there is that uh, book about love languages, you know. Um, sometimes if someone has a love language of affirmation, they really need to be told, you know, I love you, I'm proud of you, you're doing a good job, okay. That, that helps them um, stabilize their life and stabilize their emotion. And really, we can fall into that. We can be uh, so 
eager to please. Uh, we can be uh, striving to be recognized by people so much uh, that even a Christian can, can haphazardly fall into this kind of thing. Like, for example, you could be very proud of the fact that your kids are in the right Christian schools or you can be very proud that your kids are homeschooled, whatever the case may be. Or you can have all the pride in the world that you've chosen the right Christian colleges because there's bad Christian colleges or whatever. You could fill yourself up with pride in the sense that you're serving as a deacon or an elder or as a pastor. You can build yourself up because you save souls on the streets. You bring meals to the sick or the elderly. That I'm always at the church. These, these are the type of things that from the outside we can dress up and make ourselves look, look pretty good, all right? Now, on the flip side of that, there is also a Christian who lives in an unhealthy way to the unsaved community, all right? For example, is it important to you that you're recognized by Interlaken or by Ovid or by Romulus or whatever, that although you are religious, you are not like the religious over there. Okay. Oh, I know him. He is a follower of Jesus, but I'm thankful that he doesn't cram religion down my throat. Right? And you, you can build yourself up. But that is who you are. If it doesn't matter to you that the community would say, oh, he is one of us. He comes to my party even though people are drunk. He laughs at my jokes even though they're not all clean. He embraces me even though I choose to live with someone out of wedlock. He goes to non-Christian music festivals with me. He thumbs his nose at his conservative church by wearing t-shirts and a morning service, and the list goes on, and he's like, I like that guy. I like a Christian like that. He's thumbing his nose at the religious elite. And you can, you can build yourself up like that. Like, ah, oh, I'm one of the community. The community loves me because my Christianity is so perfect because I'm, I'm, I'm more like them. Okay? The truth is, it's possible that you are actually living your life for you in the center of your comfort level and not really for God. And that could go either way, okay? Whether you're super conservative or super liberal, it doesn't matter, okay? You could fall into that same trap. And the question becomes, are you deliberately trying to be noticed, okay? You may pride yourself in being a good example of a true believer and you may do all the things that you do in the name of God, but do you do them to be seen by men? Are you just hoping that someone will feed your ego by saying, what a godly man? Or what an example you are to this conservative and legalistic group of hypocrites. Praise God for you. Praise God that you're there because they need you there more than you know. Legalism, as one commentator put it, is an attempt to add anything to the finished work of Christ. It is to trust in anything other than Christ and his finished work for one standing before God. And so I know some of these things kind of come up once in a while in a church, and these are just examples that I thought of very quickly because we know them well. You know, for example, are you required to dress up for church? Required to dress up for church? Are you required to cut your hair, men or ladies, to not cut your hair? Are you required to attend all the services? Are you required to embrace Christmas or Easter? Some of the easiest examples could be from the scriptures found in Colossians 2. And so I want to go there. Uh, Keith has been taking us through the book of Colossians. And so if you haven't spent time with him, in Sunday school, I'd encourage you to come, or it is recorded for you, but in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, we read, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, 
rather than according to Christ. And then I want to give you verses 16 to the end. It says, therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but not the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement or, you know, Like they used to hurt their bodies in a religious way in order to live a more self-controlled life. And the worship of the angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not withholding fast to the head from which the entire body, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, grows with a growth which is from God. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why? As if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which refer to things destined to perish with use in accordance to what the commandments and teachings of men. These are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. I was thinking a lot about this idea of uh, satisfying the flesh as we see it there in verse 23. And one commentary by the name of Barnes, he says it this way about this idea of to satisfy the flesh. He writes, the only effect is to satisfy or please the flesh, that is the carnal and corrupt nature that we've been talking about. For so the word flesh is often used in scriptures. The effect of these observances on which you, on which so much stress is laid as if they would promote piety, is merely to gratify pride, self-righteousness, the love of distinction, and the other carnal propensities of our nature. There seems to be a great deal of humility and piety in them. There is really little else than pride, selfishness, and ambition, end quote. And I know that the church just globally has had a lot of conversations about legalism in the past, and yet we do not have nearly enough conversations about the self-made religion that allows for anyone to behave in any way they want. This kind of unrestrained liberty or the license to act any way we want is the polar opposite of legalism, is also harmful and just as sinful as any other. When Barnes says, here seems to be a great deal of humility and piety in them. There really is little, little else than pride, selfishness, and ambition. I think he hits the nail on the head. I want to just kind of give you a, a look at what I mean between legalism and license. And so here's a picture that I found online. I can't give credit to the person who gave it to me because I don't have it. But here, on one hand, you have legalism. Uh, which is about bang the law and about keeping the law perfectly as if your salvation relies on you perfectly keeping the law. You know, if you've got to add anything to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross in order to think that you have salvation someday, you are dealing with legalism. Now, legalism could be even things like baptism. If you believe that you must be baptized in order to go to heaven, you're struggling with legalism. On the other side of it, though, you also have license, all right? Um, we don't want to be legalistic. We know that we have liberty in the middle to, to uh, have a relationship with the Lord and to have the Father's favor, and there is a spirit of freedom, freedom. But as that guy is doing so well, he can just jump off the edge of that cliff and allow his freedom to license anything he wants to do. You know? I don't care what you say. I have liberty in Christ. I'm going to do what I want to do. Here's my license. Make a copy of it for future use because I'm going to use that again. Well, that's, that's not good either. Okay? You're going to have the wrath of God come on you for even that. So I'll give you a couple examples as we close. I know I'm already heading over, which... <clears throat> I knew I was going to do. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is a, is a good example here. In the first few verses, we see where license and liberty has taken over. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is probably the most extreme example you've ever heard of. 
Uh, beginning in verse 1, it says, It is actually reported that there is immorality among you, and immorality of such of a kind as does not even exist among the Gentiles. That's a license. Holy cow. That someone has his father's wife. Here it is. Verse 2, you have become arrogant. That's the problem. It's a problem of the heart. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead so that the one who had done this deed would be removed from your midst. Okay? For I on my own part, though absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have already judged him who has so committed this as though I were present. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are assembled, and I with you in spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus, I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe one word that's uh, a, a, little, a little bit more in our face, maybe. Uh, Romans chapter 14. Again, I'll just give you the first four verses for the sake of time. Romans chapter 14. And just look at verses 1 through 4. Romans 14, 1 through 4. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge a servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand the Lord is able to make him stand. The reality is, is when you're full of yourself and when you're full of pride and arrogancy, quarrels about your opinions happen. We quarrel a lot because there's a problem of the heart. In fact, James chapter 4 and verse 1 talks about it that way, in which he says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is it not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust, here we are, with an issue of the heart and do not have, and so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel, but you do not have because you do not ask. And so if you have, a, for example, a, a, a difficult home, and if there's a, two Christians who have difference of opinion, who is right? Who is right in that moment? Well, if it's your own personal, personal home, I would say that if your son disagrees with you in your home about something and it is disrupting the, the unity of the home, the person who is at fault is the son. Because scripture says, honor your mother and your father. Period. Okay? And we could bring this right into the church and also if we have uh, disagreements of opinions and quarrels in the church, does not scripture also teach the church to honor those who lead and labor to teach the word of God before you? You may have a difference of opinion than the pastor. So be it. It happens. Scripture's pretty clear. You need to follow the leadership. That, that's, that's what's important. Okay. We could go on and on. Uh, maybe with the next week or so, we'll, we'll kind of finish this up. But what we're talking about here is an attitude of the heart. And Christ is saying that you are blessed if you are pure in heart. Okay? The second level of growth, which I often find people can stay here a very long time, kind of like, I don't know if you know somebody who is 40 or 80 who acts like a 16-year-old. I mean, pe people can really kind of be trapped in a 16-year-old mind for, for a very long time. I think here... In this second level of learning, people can be trapped for a really long time because in the second level of growth, you see a propensity to create your own man-made religion. You know enough about the Lord and you know enough about faith where you just start establishing what you think the church should be. And you create your own church. You do it your own way. That's, that's, that's propensity of our hearts. You may love the law and command everyone else around you to obey it to such a degree as to look legalistic, or you may also love liberty so much as to create a man-made religion where anything goes. And there are both of these kinds of churches in the world today. I know that you've seen them. And we're not living so far from Ithaca where we don't literally see it. <laughs> okay? 
And so my challenge to us this morning and to the church at large, whoever finds us on YouTube, is that we, first of all, individually need to examine our own heart and say, are I, am I pure? Is my heart pure? Am I totally sold out to the Lord? Okay? Working to rid myself of impurity or working to rid myself of selfishness and pride. Because if we find ourselves like Lot's wife in Genesis 19 and verse 26, we're going to suffer for it. All right? Lot and his wife had one command. When you leave this place, I'm going to burn it on fire. Don't look back. Lot's wife had to look back because she was taking her values with her. And so she had to look back because everything she valued was behind her. Not before her, with the Lord in perfect unity. And I would pray that we're not like that church. That we wouldn't turn ourselves into a pillar of salt right here in our community and become ineffective for the sake of the gospel. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your word and for its impact on our life. Lord, I just pray that you would really do your work in us in a magnificent way so that we may grow and labor and stay in unity and have a pure heart before you. Lord, we just pray that you look down at our little church and say, you see those guys? Ah, they, they got it. I'm so proud of them. I can't wait to add my favor to what they're doing in that little place. Lord, I just pray that all of us would have a pure heart before you and that we would go out in a spirit of unity. And for any of us who are struggling with a sin in our life, that we would just repent of it, make it right, turn it over to you, get back on the horse and keep going down this difficult road that you've called us to. Lord, we thank you that you've called us to a difficult road and that you haven't left us stranded to do it all ourselves, but that you've given us the power of the Holy Spirit to walk with you, and we pray that we would. We pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen.